Beyond the physical effects of Green Bay's weather, there is a psychological edge that comes from playing in the NFL's harshest environment. It's Friday, January 13th, 2023, and welcome back to Goodfellows, a Hoover Institution broadcast examining social, economic, political, and geopolitical concerns. I'm Bill Whalen. I'm a Hoover Distinguished Policy Fellow. That means I have the high honor and privilege of introducing the stars of our show, three of my colleagues we jokingly refer to as the Goodfellows. That would be the historian Neil Ferguson, the economist John Cochran, the geostrategist Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, they are Hoover Institution Senior Fellows all. And rounding out our panel today, joining us from his district back in Wisconsin, Congressman Mike Gallagher. He is the newly minted chair of the House Select Committee on China. Its formal name is the House United States House Select Committee on Strategic Competition between the United States and Chinese Communist Party. Congressman, thanks for joining us today. It is an honor to be back. So question, sir, why are you not on a plane to San Francisco to see the Packers play in the 49ers? Oh, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. The Packers oh, didn't make the playoffs, did they? Uh, low, low blow. Although watching the Lions game, I sort of got a bizarre solace from the fact that there's no way we would have beaten the 49ers. It was it was very depressing, but we'll see. We'll see. Hope springs eternal in Green Bay, Wisconsin. There you go. So, Congressman, let's get into China today. I want to read you a quote you said on Fox News last month. Quote, the Chinese Communist Party is our foremost threat in the world today. Question, sir, is that a commonly held sentiment in the House? Is it a commonly held sentiment in the Senate? And is a commonly held sentiment in the Biden administration? I actually think it is. Now, there's attempts to parse the language. I mean, if you see uh, recent documents from the White House, the National Security Strategy, um, if you see documents from the uh, the Pentagon, the National Defense Strategy, or just hear the chairman of the Joint Chiefs or the Secretary of Defense talk about it, sometimes they try and do, the White House will try and say, well, climate change is the existential issue of our time, but China you know, is a, I forget the exact phrase they use in the National Security Strategy. So there's a, a little bit of uh, muddled thinking, I think, in that. And then the Defense Department will say, well, Russia's an acute threat, but China, you know, I've heard the chairman say China's our biggest near, mid and long term threat. So you parse through the language. I actually think one of the most remarkable achievements of H.R. McMaster and Matt Pottinger and many others in the Trump administration was to incept into the Biden administration the biggest shift in U.S. foreign policy since the end of the Cold War. It built on a recognition that the Chinese Communist Party is our top threat, our top competitor, whatever language you want to use. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen? There's a, we, we batted around whether to take the climate stuff seriously. HR told us not to. But it is the national security strategy, and it, it directs things like, you know, if, if they said, well, well, we want Taiwan, but we'll, uh, we'll put in windmills instead. National security strategy says you're supposed to give them that. Uh, what's your view on that? Is it serious or just puffery? I actually think it's more than puffery. I think it's very serious. Um, yeah, I, th I think you have a, a, a divide in the administration that that hampers our, our foreign policy and hampers sensible policy for moving forward. You have sort of a John Kerry climate change wing on the one hand that's saying, you know, the biggest issue is a transnational issue is climate change. And therefore, you know, we need to have a more cooperative relationship with Xi Jinping, that Xi Jinping cares about commitments that are made at COP27, which I think is naive and foolish. Uh, and then you have sort of a more realistic uh, wing. I don't know who the leader of that wing would be. Maybe it's Eli Ratner. Maybe it's Jake Sullivan himself. Uh, I don't know. But I, I think there's sort of a competition between those two wings that gets in the way of good policy sometimes. So I take it seriously. And I take it seriously if for no other reason than we're spending a heck of a lot of money on sort of Green New Deal policies that I think are um, uh, a mixed bag at best and and, and actively economically harmful uh, at worst. And, and that is connected to the health of our overall country and our foreign policy. Maybe there's less of a contradiction, though, in the sense that China is a huge part of the reason for increased CO2 emissions. Uh, China is responsible for a huge proportion of the increase in coal consumption. So if you're concerned about climate, then you have to be concerned about China. And, and there's no way that we address the problem of global warming if we can't constrain China. I wanted to ask a slightly different question, if I may, uh, Congressman. It's about Cold War. One thing that struck me about the new national security strategy, and it's been done in speeches too by people uh, in the administration, is that they say we're not in a Cold War with China, but then everything else that comes after that sounds remarkably like a Cold War, including the kind of methods that they're proposing 
to use to constrain China, like limiting Chinese access to Western technology. Are you comfortable with calling it Cold War II, as I've been doing for the last four or five years? Uh, I am. I think I stole it from you. I, I usually <laughs> say new new Cold War. Uh, I've written multiple op-eds using that framework, and I think it's useful both for the similarities and the differences that it illuminates. Uh, the similarities, I guess, would be that this is, in some sense, a whole of society effort for both of uh, the competitors. You have two sort of, it's not just a, a military competition, it's an economic competition and an ideological competition uh, at its core. Um, the differences are, are very obvious as well. We never had to consider selective economic decoupling when it comes to technology, data, and dollars with the Soviet Union because our economies didn't really uh, interact. And I think that's actually what makes the new Cold War in some ways more difficult uh, than the old. I mean, I would be lying to you if I said I had a neat and tidy policy solution for you know, every American company that has exposure to the Chinese market. And where do you draw the line for decoupling? Do I really have a problem with uh, Wisconsin farmers selling soybeans to China? No. Do I have a problem with Wisconsinites buying cheap t-shirts from China? No. But I do have a problem with a, an app, a social media app that's controlled by a Chinese company that's controlled by the Chinese Communist Party becoming the most dominant media company in America in the form of TikTok. I have a problem with us, with them using American technology to advance their hypersonic uh, technology. Uh, I have a problem with them controlling the commanding heights of rare earths. I have a problem with the energetics, the propellants, okay. explosives, and pyrotechnics that make our weapons go and go boom being sourced from China in many cases. But drawing that line is very, very difficult. But I thank you for using the analogy. It gives me credibility when I can cite Neil Ferguson and Walter Russell Mead and some others to show people that I'm not just a crazy hawk. Hey, hey Mike, you're, you're really you're not just a crazy hawk. And I think when, whenever I hear these days about <laughs> people lamenting, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the dysfunction of Congress, the, the, the you know, the, the, uh, you know, the, the tension and, and, uh, and vitriol surrounding the, the speaker's, you know, the speaker's election. Yeah, I just kind of point to your committee and then you and other members, right, who are determined to have a positive influence through bipartisan legislation. Hey, could you maybe just talk to, to our viewers a little bit more about how you frame the effort? Because I saw your areas of focus and I can imagine, you know, lines of effort and goals and objectives coming out of that and the degree to which you, you feel you have bipartisan support for those focus areas. Well, I was hoping we could just use this as a brainstorming session. I intend to force all of you to come testify before the committee at some point, so we might as well get started on that. Effort <laughs> right now. One other final point on Cold War, though. I, I think like part of the point is that we would want the new Cold War to stay cold. And for those who sort of think this is a bad thing to be talking about a Cold War, we might need to wrap our head around the fact that that's sort of the best case scenario right now. There are worse things than Cold War. I mean, this thing could heat up and we don't want it to heat up, because that would be very, very uh, destructive. To your point, uh, uh, HR, uh, I'll maybe do it in reverse order. Um, yeah, I, I, the vote we got on the creation of the committee, 365 to 65, uh, was great. I was really encouraged by that. Sitting there listening to the debate on the House floor, uh, listening to a lot of what my Democratic colleagues said about wanting to participate was very encouraging. And the speaker is sincere in wanting this to be a bipartisan effort. I know the historians here can quibble over the idea that politics stops at the water's edge. I don't think it ever has. But to the extent that we can, in Congress, identify, you know, here's the center of gravity on China policy. Here's where Democrats and Republicans uh, agree. I think it makes our foreign policy uh, stronger. So that I'm very encouraged by. And then informally, a lot of my Democratic colleagues have come up to me, a lot of smart, serious people with the right background and national security, they want to participate. So I'm cautiously optimistic we'll get good members on this committee. Where can we have a unique impact? Um, I think really really in, in two areas. One, sort of elevating the discussion on China and explaining why all this matters, right? Like why, why should the American people care about the threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party? Why does it matter to someone in Northeast Wisconsin? You know, think about, we talk about Taiwan, the defense of Taiwan. And, you know, I think for defense geeks, we sort of assume that everyone thinks that we should help th Taiwan defend itself. My observation, you know, at the intersection of kind of defense policy and, and like retail uh, grassroots politics is that we have a long way to go to convincing the American people that we should be moving heaven and earth to improve our deterrence by denial posture in the Indo-Pacific and answering that question for why it matters. So I think we can be the committee that answers that why. The second thing is because China related policy is referred to so many different committees, right? Armed services has a clear role. Foreign affairs does armed sales. 
ways and means does trade policy. Financial services has an obvious role in terms of the American capital that's flowing into certain Chinese industries. Uh, judiciary controls FARA laws. CFIUS referred to multiple committees. A lot of good ideas fall through the cracks between the committees, and we can play a coordinating function to ensure that for the 10 to 20 priority policies and pieces of legislation for the speaker, they don't die in a divided Congress, and we're going to actually get some things done. Maybe I'll add one other thing, and I'm sorry to go on. There are certain things that are just poorly understood, like niche niche issues that we intend to own. So for example, I mentioned TikTok. TikTok's bound up in this broader question of what is the regulatory framework for cross-border data flows? There's something called the ICTS process that I think you guys started in the Trump administration. It exists. It's, it's kind of the Wild West, though, right now. And, you know, Abe, before he died, gave a great speech about a data free flow with trust model that seemed to make sense. But, you know, we, we can kind of grab that issue and run with it. Uh, another one is just, uh, you know, what I would call counter united front work. I think united front work is probably the like the worst understood aspect of the Chinese Communist Party. And if we do nothing other than educate our colleagues as to what it is and, and why it matters, I think we'll have played a constructive role. That being said, I give me your best ideas for where we can- hey, be Just, just a couple a couple comments just on the same idea of connecting what has been disconnected, right? So if you look at economic statecraft, I mean, you know, the tools that are available are you know, export controls, it, you know, inbound investment screening under the CFIUS process, the Committee for Foreign Investment in the United States, outbound investment screening. I mean, there are a whole range of tools, you know, right? there, there are ones involving human capital. Immigration is a big part of this, you know, being able to attract the, the top talent as well as grow the, the top talent. And, you know, there's, I, I often uh, quote Antoine Bousquet, he's a, he's a historian. I don't know if you know him, Neil, but he wrote a great book called The Scientific War, Way of Warfare. But, but he, what he observed, he said, what is required is a holistic approach that does not seek to isolate open systems from their environment, but apprehends their profound interconnectedness. And when we, we take discrete actions in one area, like export controls, but don't consider you know, investments in technologies and supply chains to make our supply chains more resilient, or we don't consider you know, the human capital dimensions, we oftentimes work at cross purposes. So I, I think it's great that you are looking across. That's why I think that the organizations committee is perfect because you're drawing people from those committees that have oversight of these different parts of the of the challenge. Just quick point on that. I think um, you know. That, that, I think you're honing in on, on what is a, an emerging big idea, and it, I think it, it may sound simplistic to this crowd, but just the basic idea of we cannot we cannot selectively decouple without simultaneously deepening our partnerships uh, with with allied countries when it comes to technology sharing when it comes to data sharing, when it comes to you know trade in general. And the trade agenda has completely fallen by the wayside for both parties, I would argue right now. Or how do we leverage existing allied frameworks or new cooperative structures such as AUKUS to do that, right? Part of the problem with AUKUS, and, and this was a problem that predated AUKUS when we talked about incorporating Australia into our national technology industrial base, we have all this outdated ITAR legislation, inter, uh, international trafficking and arms regulation, which precludes us from cooperating with the Aussies and the Brits, our closest allies. We're going to try and reform ITAR to turbocharge uh, technological cooperation uh, under uh, under AUKUS. So I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit there that we can really uh, grab. But I, uh, I'd like to ask a, a big picture question, then we'll come back to these weeds, because I'm a little skeptical of a lot of this stuff. I'm, I'm an economist. I've seen all sorts of skullduggery wrapped in the flag in, in my time. And uh, lots of people are lining up for subsidies. So China, China, give me money. Lots of people are lining up for protection. China, China, give me protection. Uh, this, this hasn't ended well, especially competitive industrial policy in the past. Let me ask you, what is the long-term goal? What is the vision? If we are in Cold War II, uh, what's the vision for where it ends? Are we now fighting the war or are we trying to deter uh, China from fighting um, fighting the war uh, is the long run goal, um, you know, like it was with uh, with Russia, isolate them, impoverish them, and and wait for them to change regime. Uh, impoverishing a large country like that seems like a very difficult and not particularly noble goal. Is the goal to set um, a set of incentives so that China will at least engage? Uh, and, you know, we would hope liberalize at some point internally. I see a lot of answers in search of questions, and I see this dangerous dynamic of a bar fight 
Uh, you know, the guy comes and bumps into you and spills your drink. And so the re reaction is, well, I'm going to go push him and call his mother a bad name. Well, that usually doesn't end well. Uh, how are we going to get out of this bar? Surely you've thought about this. You know, where, where's the George Kennan <laughs> on what we're going to try to do over 20, 30, 40 years? Well, at the record show, I've, I've lost both of the bar fights I've been in in my life. So I'm, I'm <laughs> ill-equipped uh, to do this. One of which happened at the Hofbrau House in, in Munich uh, when I was a, a pesky college student. Uh, it was a big misunderstanding. Uh, but, uh, um, uh, uh, and I suspect, John, I can't get away with saying that the long-term vision is we win, they lose. Though politicians have, have done fairly well relying on that. Uh, well, what past. do you mean by they lose? Uh, that yeah. they, they are reduced to rubble, impoverished, the way Germany lost World War II. Uh, they lose, they give up the Communist Party and join liberal democratic society and then turn into something that looks like South Korea. Well, like, that's answerable easily enough with the Cold War I analogy, because what Reagan did was essentially to set the United States on track to win without firing a shot and without reducing the Soviet Union to rubble. You mentioned Kennan. Kennan's vision was always that in the end, the Soviet Union would succumb to its own internal pathologies. We just had to contain it for a sufficiently long period. And I would say a reasonable starting point for this discussion is that we want to try and do that again, because it was a pretty good outcome. I 100% agree with you, Mike. Avoiding World War III should be priority number one, uh, just as it was in Cold War I. It was a very good idea not to have World War III with nuclear weapons. Let's make that another number one priority. And let's try and replay uh, the way in which Cold War I ended, which was pretty peacefully with the internal decay of the Soviet Union playing out and the United States not having to do more than maintain credible deterrence right the way through the, the tougher part of, of the first Cold War. Am I thinking about this the right way, Mike? I agree with everything you just said. Um, you know, I sort of think about this. I've stolen this analogy from our mutual friend and your colleague, Matt Pottinger. You sort of think about this in two phases. There, There is the traditional marathon that we all think about winning. And I, I do think it, it in, in the best case scenario, ends in, in some way roughly analogous to the old Cold War, um, where, you know, the regime some succumbs to its own uh, pathologies or you know, uh, abandons uh, certain ambitions that would allow them to blackmail the rest of the world economically or, you know, take ex export their model of techno totalitarian oppression to Taiwan and other countries. But it's as if to qualify for that marathon, you have to win the near term sprint. And the near term sprint is all about deterrence by denial uh, in the Taiwan Strait. But if um, I may, the, the Reagan administration won. Uh, and the economic competition, not by some large industrial policy, not by taking whatever the Soviets were subsidizing and out subsidizing it here. He won by deregulation, getting the economy growing like crazy. And that does not seem the U.S. We are killing our internal yeah. STEM and science. It, we're just allowing it to shoot itself completely in the foot. Uh, we're still hidebound by all sorts of stuff. You know, the, the answer there was let the internal American economy grow, not a, you know, large competitive industrial policy uh, approach. But I don't I don't think me endorsing new Cold War and attempting to articulate an endgame, it like it doesn't follow from there that I'm endorsing massive no, industrial. You're not. I Many mean, other my, people. Are. I think my voting <laughs> record would support that as well. And I think a lot of what we need to do to win is just like act less like you know, uh, CCP light uh, apparatchiks in, in our own uh, domestic uh, endeavor endeavors sort of resist the pull uh, of wokeism in various educational institutions and unlock the, and unleash the power of free enterprise in America and get out of this just pattern of of self loathing where we no longer believe that we deserve to win that we no longer believe that in this competition we're the good guys. Those are all things that we can do irrespective of, you know, what Xi Jinping wakes up uh, and wants to do. Um, but I will say the question, uh, and I got it, I sort of tried to get at it when we talked about selective decoupling, uh, drawing the line is very, very difficult. Um, and I, I, I didn't vote for the, for the CHIPS Act. We can get into that. I suspect five years from now, you know, we won't have the, the fabs that we need um, for a variety of reason, uh, but I'm sympathetic to the idea that we can't allow uh, the Chinese Communist Party, particularly to take over Taiwan, to 
control uh, semiconductor manufacturing and then hold the rest of us economically hostage? How do you solve that problem? This is the thorniest part of the equation for me. Uh, I, I will admit a great deal of humility in part mm. because I'm, I'm not mm. an economist as well. Hey, you know, I, I think the objective is kind of simple overall. The overall goal is to prevent the Chinese Communist Party from, from achieving its vision for national rejuvenation at our expense, right? And at what, by what at our expense means is accomplishing their objectives uh, that place us at a profound disadvantage, us being the free world, free market economic systems, democratic nations, right? They want to, they first want to continue this massive military buildup, but also to gain a qualitative differential advantage, a technological differential advantage over our military. So they can, you know, through intimidation, or through aggression, achieve sort of uh, exclusionary areas of primacy across the Indo-Pacific and then challenge the United States globally. So that's like a negative objective, for prevent them from doing that. Of course, the means that they employ to do that are in large measure stealing the technology that, that, that we develop uh, as, as well as, as uh, garnering investments from US companies in Chinese companies that must act by law as an extension of the Chinese Communist Party and the People's Liberation Army. I mean, great example, Mike, I can send you some others. A company named Four Paradigm, you know, raised $700 million from U.S. venture capital uh, investors. Uh, that company now does all the battlefield artificial intelligence for the People's Liberation Army. I mean, there, there are many, many other examples of that. And then, of course, you have the way that we are enabling our own demise economically in many ways, uh, and enabling their mercantilist model to succeed is through the dumb money flows that are the scaffolding that holds up their system, you know. And and so I, I just think, in, in many ways, we I, I, what we can do, I, I think, is stop underwriting our own demise. And it begins almost with like a Hippocratic oath: do no hurt or harm in three fundamental areas. Don't help them gain an unfair differential advantage over the United States militarily through the theft of technology and so forth. The, the second is, you know, don't enable them to gain a, an unfair economic and financial advantage uh, over us through their authoritarian mercantilist model and our enabling of it. And, you know, the third area, I think, is to not enable them to perfect their technologically enabled Orwellian police state. And oftentimes we do that with investments. I think, you know, U.S. investors that invested in sense time in Hick vision, I mean, how do you look at yourself in the mirror? You know, I mean, so I, I think that a lot of it is, you know, just I mean, there's this there's this old cartoon of of a guy watering a sapling with a noose around his neck, tied to the sap tied to the sapling, and I think that you know, China is the sapling, and we've been watering that thing, and 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 we're hanging ourselves. And I, just two quick thoughts on that HR. I don't think it's industrial policy to say that. U.S. capital should not subsidize genocide and PLA military modernization. I think that, that's fundamentally different than, I think, a concern you're articulating, John, which is that, you know, federal government subsidies in various industries have a distorting effect. Um, and also both what you said, HR, and what Neil said about our long-term objective, I think should remind us of something, which is that ours is a defensive strategy. In some ways, unlike the early Cold War, old, early old Cold War, we're not debating rollback per se. We, we, we're defending the status quo from totalitarian aggression. And I think that if we talk about that the right way, that could go a long way in terms of persuading some of the more isolationist members of Congress on the left and the right to invest smart resources in the defense of Taiwan and uh, in, the def def uh, in our own defense in other areas of the world. Can we talk about Taiwan? We talked about it the last time you right. were our, our guest, and I want to kind of up update our, our audience. Um, if I, I'm going to play devil's advocate because it's, it's hugely important in these conversations that we don't just sit around agreeing. Uh, from a Chinese vantage point, it's not clear that the US is entirely respecting the status quo with respect to Taiwan. Certainly, the president has come close, I think, on three or more occasions to repudiating the strategic ambiguity, uh, making an unconditional uh, commitment to the defense of Taiwan. And there's no question that US politicians, including the former Speaker Nancy Pelosi, have acted in their, their visits as if Taiwan is an independent country. And I, I spent enough time in Beijing to see why 
the Chinese leadership think there's a deviation from the status quo going on. Uh, and I worry a little bit that we are gung-ho about Taiwan without having a particularly good strategy for the eventuality of a crisis. Let me put it to you that next year, I don't think it'll happen this year, but next year with a Taiwanese election in January, a US presidential election in November, there's going to be a very dangerous time if we carry on down this road because we are nowhere near Bridge Colby's uh, strategy of denial. We're not really credibly able to deter China at the moment. And I worry a lot that the Biden administration failed to deter Putin. I mean, let's let's not forget, it failed to deter him with respect to Ukraine. And I worry that they're going to fail to deter Xi Jinping with respect to Taiwan. And then we're really going to be stuck with a much bigger, much tougher uh, situation uh, if a Let's suppose the Chinese blockade Taiwan. I don't think going to be mm. this invasion is what we should really be focused on. Suppose they blockade it. What do we do? Do we really have, in your eyes, a credible plan for next year? Let's just talk hypothetically about next year if we get into that situation. That's my biggest short-run concern. I'd love to get your current thoughts on that. Well, one thing you said makes me think that there is a real risk, a, a political risk, or a, there's, a, there's going to be a political temptation that plays out in the context of our presidential election on the Republican side to stake out an ever more hawkish position on Taiwan. Right. You're already seeing it. Some prospective candidates have said we should just support Taiwan's independence, right? Which would be a massive departure from yeah. uh, traditional uh, policy. So perhaps part of the function that my committee can play is both, you know, in, in, in the in the way where I just said, we're gonna play this accelerating function when it comes to policy and legislation, Perhaps at times we'll have to play a restraining function to make sure that we kind of all stay on the reservation uh, and do things that are in our own national security interest. That being said, I, I would quibble with the idea that like Pelosi's visit to Taiwan upends the status quo in any meaningful way. It, you could you could argue it was not well timed. You could argue she didn't come with, you know, a C-130 filled with harpoon missiles or, you know, whatever the deliverable was. Uh, you could argue that it was purely a media play for her legacy as speaker. I don't know if it made it into the Netflix documentary or the HBO documentary. I get I get all that. But I think to say that that was, you know, that upended the status quo is to accept the CCP's talking points on that. No, but I as a devil's also... advocate, I think yeah. one can see that the more such visits happen, the more plausibly the CCP will be able to argue that we're treating Taiwan de facto as if it's independent. And if a candidate emerges for the Taiwanese presidency, who sounds as if he, uh, and it's likely a he, has at least some leanings in that direction, I'm worried about how that plays into the CCP's hands by giving them a story they can tell to the Chinese people to the effect that we are, in fact, the ones who are who are rocking. Are, 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 are you arguing right. for addressing their legitimate security concerns like we did with Putin, Neil, before before the invasion? Yeah. I mean, uh, come on. I mean, I, I mean, Neil I think, asked, I think you know, Neil they, asked they, they don't get to dictate who visits yeah. Taiwan. They don't get to no. dictate it. And we just no, say hey, Neil, asked, Neil asked a huge question dictate. here. Suppose well, China does what I think they the, the obvious move. They blockade Taiwan. They say food, medicine, goods come in and go. This is part of China. You said this is part of China. You simply have to go through China border controls on your way to Taiwan. And we're not letting Stinger missiles in, but everything else goes in and out. What does the US do then? Uh, stern denunciation at the UN, maybe. The only thing I can think of is financial sanctions, which is basically blow up the financial system, which would be a huge problem for us as well as them. But I, I don't see a shoot. That, that just seems like game over right there. I'm, I'm desperate for HR. HR said, there's no problem you can't solve with a tank. <laughs> well, in this that case, like there's problem no problem. Can't... In this case, there's no problem you can't solve with a submarine, and nobody talks about submarines. You know what they talk about? about no, 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 uh, but that's a problem. About, about, about China, about China, China blockades China Taiwan, blockade. and you send a submarine into blo to sink well, Chinese I mean, ships. Th think of if there is a, a recent analogy to this. The analogy I think is the is the tanker war from eighty to eighty eight, with obviously a much less capable navy, but uh, with an Iranian. Uh, military that was using some asymmetrical uh, capabilities, especially mines, right? And and uh, we applied with you know, we we you know we responded with a naval task force that was you know defensive in nature to ensure the free flow uh, of oil uh, out of out of the straits. And I can imagine something like that, John. But I, I think Neil's question also was, hey, do we have a plan to do that? Plus, 
you know, the military capacity. I think that what we could be doing from a diplomatic perspective, for sure, is to gain uh, guarantees in advance that this would be a multinational effort to say, hey, you know, People's Liberation Army Navy, you know, you don't get to tell us uh, that we can't sail uh, our commercial ships uh, into Taiwanese ports. And guess what? We're doing it. Uh, and try to, if you try to stop us, uh, we're going to have to act in a way to defend those ships. And again, you know, this is we, we don't we necessarily have to reflag all these ships like we did uh, in the 1980s. But I think there are analogies we can draw on to better understand, you know, kind of the range of responses that we could make. And and of course, you can respond to ways that are asymmetrical, right? If you hey, if you restrict moving into Taiwan, how about if we restrict Chinese shipping now through the Straits of Malacca? How about if we block that off? You know, I mean, I, I think there are all sorts of options open. Uh, and and I think much like Russia prior to the invasion of Ukraine, I do believe, and we shouldn't underestimate them, but I do believe that, that the People's Liberation Army, you know, which includes all their services, probably has an inflated idea of what they can accomplish. Uh, so, you know, so, I, so I, Congressman, how does the United States deter Xi Jinping? Well, quickly, I think Neil, Neil has a good point, which is I, <clears throat> myself, I'm not personally... Um, comfortable or persuaded by the war plans such as they exist. Um, and I think they're, they rest on a lot of assumptions that are uh, naive. Um, and I don't think integrated deterrence uh, is going to get the job done here. A vague threat of sanctions combined with some mean tweets will not, you know, make a Xi Jinping, a Xi Jinping think twice uh, in the same way that integrated deterrence failed uh, in Ukraine. So how then do we deter? Uh, we need to surge hard power. And it's my belief that hard power gives us our best chance at deterrence west of the international date line in general. And I think we need to flip, flip the script when it comes to what the PLA has done to us with their rocket force against us such that we can target their ships at relatively low cost. And there we are unbound, thanks to HR's work uh, by the INF Treaty, such that we could field INF non-compliant missiles uh, at relatively low cost over the next two to five years. That they're, I think they're, already developed, they're already developed. Yeah, it's not you know, new technology. And, yeah. It is rocket science, technically, but it's not you know new technology. Um, so if you think about this, CSBA recently did a great por- report called Rings of Fire that I stole in a speech I did on this. You think about this as like a series of concentric rings in the Pacific. The inner part of that is Taiwan itself. We can clear the $18 billion backlog of foreign military sales that have been approved but not delivered to Taiwan's. We can take some of the harpoons that we're going to spend money demailing send them to Taiwan. There's a lot. We can move them ahead of the Saudis on the list. There's a lot of things we can do. To art, We can use loitering munitions. We can get really creative on Taiwan itself. You go to the next ring, small teams of Marines. We now have a basing and access agreement in the Ryukus in Japan. If we get a similar thing with the Northern Philippines, now we're cooking with gas right there. Then we can make them think twice. And then you zoom out to the outer ring with an INF non-compliant missile using advanced energetic materials Imagine stationing one of those in Alaska, or if we give the Aussies some semblance of sovereign control in the Northern Territories of Australia, I think we can get really creative in building what I call an anti-Navy. If you expect that it will take us at least a decade to rebuild our own Navy and Air Force, the question is, what can you do in the next five years within the window of maximum danger? And I think we can, if we had a, a good president and a hypercharged Secretary of Defense with the right concept, I think we could actually put an anti-Navy in Xi's path and make him think twice. And if you go back to the writings of Mackinder, right, on what the what the requirements are to have a dominant continental power, one of those elements are free access to the seas, which we enjoy, uh, located where we are in North America. Neither Russia nor China enjoys that, which is one of the reasons why Taiwan looks so attractive to them. If you look at the map uh, and, and, and just turn the map 90 degrees to the left, you see Taiwan as the cork in the bottle really there. And and the other analogy that works is the Japanese, you know, the centripetal offensive in 1941, after which Japan oriented those defenses outward uh, toward the United States under the belief that we would never pay the price to penetrate that inner island chain and threaten Japan d- directly. If you take that concept and flip it 180 degrees and orient it on the Eurasian landmass, I mean, China has big problems. Not that we want to do this to pose them with the problem, but to tell them, hey, listen, you know, if you want to go after Taiwan, if you want to lay claim to the ocean in the South China Sea, you're going to have some major problems. And then the last thing I'll, just, I'll say here too, Mike, is and, and I'm sure you'll be looking at this, are emerging technologies that are relevant. 
Uh, and and you know there are low cost undersea drones uh, that there's a company in Southern California developing, and there's a startup here that is developing low cost swarm drones uh, that that are really perfect for for targeting China's you know long range missile strike complex, right? The combination of radars and sensors and and missiles that you need to make that work. Isn't the best analogy though, HR, just the previous three Taiwan Strait crises? Right, all of which involved sort of massive. Uh, 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 I don't know. I don't, I'm trying to use a word that's not scatological. Uh, required a lot of cojones on on our part. Uh, right. So in the first one, Eisenhower gets it an AUMF from Congress in advance. I believe threatens the use of nuclear weapons at one point. And then the second Eisenhower crisis deploys Matador cruise missiles, massive mobilization. And then the third under Clinton, that was the biggest show of force since the end of the Vietnam War. I mean, which kind of gets to the paradox of deterrence. I mean, in order to prevent World War III, which we all want, you need to convince the other guy you're willing to go to war. It's not easy, for sure. Um, the but- difference is clear. I mean, China is a far more formidable True. military and naval power than it was in the mid-1990s right. when True. they they really had to back down. And my, my great concern is another analogy, which we haven't talked about, but the most obvious one, which is the Cuban Missile Crisis, where... In a funny kind of way, the roles are re- reversed because in 1962, an island that was uh, close to the United States, uh, far from the Soviet Union, became the bone of contention. And it was the Soviets who had to run uh, over a very great distance a US uh, naval blockade. The, the roles would be reversed. I mean, we could find ourselves in the position the Soviets were in in 62, having to send uh, a naval force a very long way. Uh, to to challenge a blockade. And the more we study the Cuban Missile Crisis, the more we see how close the world came to World War III uh, with with Soviet submarines. You mentioned submarines, HR, uh, essentially about to fire nuclear-tipped torpedoes. At Even the order to fire. I really worry about... Well, given, given the latitude, not the order, the latitude to fire, right, 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 right. which was what was surprising. Yeah. Down to yeah. one commander who said, no, I'm not going to do it. So yeah. we don't want to... re. I don't think we should rerun the Cold War with that meticulous attention to detail that we actually do the Cuban Missile Crisis over, because we might get a different and less good outcome this time around. Uh, we were discussing this uh, only yesterday with Philip Zelika, who was visiting us at, at Hoover. I, I desperately want to avoid rerunning the Cuban Missile Crisis over Taiwan. And my worry is that before Taiwan is credibly defended, before it's a porcupine, before we've done the things that you just very, I think, persuasively described, because it's it's certainly going to take several years. There's this window of vulnerability where they could decide to gamble because it's obvious that time's running out. I take the view that Xi Jinping regards Taiwan as his ultimate goal, the reason he has extended his term in office. He's not about to just put that aside and say, oh, shucks, it was nice while I thought about it, but on second thoughts, no. That seems unlikely to me. He's now in a position of uh, total dominance, that was confirmed by the party, but he also turns out to be more of a risk taker than we knew, uh, willing to, to to cast aside zero COVID, incur really significant numbers of deaths. Uh, I, I, the more I look at this China and this Chinese leader, the more I think we must not underestimate his readiness to take risk in the relatively short run. I think your committee, you're absolutely right to say this, Mike, has a, it's going to have to keep people from going uh, so hawkish that they feed uh, an increasingly, I think, militant nationalism in Beijing that ultimately spills over into that second Cuban Missile Crisis that worries me a lot. And I was interested that you, you pointed out that there are kind of super hawks emerging. It's almost as if domestic politics is driving a competition between the parties in the United States to see who can be the more hawkish. I wanted to ask you why that is. I remember asking another uh, legislator in a different uh, chamber of Congress about this, and his reply was, you know, it's simple. My people blame China for COVID. In Wisconsin, what do people have against China, even if they don't quite know where Taiwan is? What's, What's driving this hawkishness in American politics. COVID is is certainly part of it. Um, and, it, you know, if reasonable, people can sort of disagree about whether it came from a lab in Wuhan, which I think is most likely, or whether it came from a wet market. I don't think it's arguable that the CCP did everything possible to cover it up and cost us time 
and cost us millions of lives uh, in the process. So I think that's certainly part of it. But prior to that, I think you have an economic story. We're here in the industrial Midwest. People blame China for the hollowing out of a lot of industries. It's uh, That being said, it's not like anyone's ever come up to me at a town hall and said, you know what? China's accession to the WTO was a really bad idea. But like that, they're they're expressing that in other ways, if that makes sense. Right. The third sort of candidate causal variable I would suggest, and I'd be curious to get your take. I think there's something when when Americans see uh, the NBA sort of bending the knee to Xi Jinping or or Hollywood or take your pick of like the most egregious example of this. This this fealty paid to the Chinese for fear of losing market access. I almost think it like offends people in America. Uh, may, maybe it gets a little bit at like the Jacksonian impulse in America. People look at that and say, "Ah, oh, we just look we look weak." I hate that. How do we let this country get this much leverage over us? Does that make sense at all? So, yeah. Congressman, so Congressman, you've said you want to have Adam Silver appear before your committee. You've said you want to have Bob Iger appear from the committee. What do you want to hear from the CEO of Disney, and what do you want to hear from the commissioner of the NBA? You know, I just would like them to talk honestly about the trade-offs that they're they're having to make, and I'd like to ask them some tough questions about, you know, how do, do they still even consider themselves an American company in any meaningful sense? And when it comes to making a decision to censor a movie, uh, to have a more friendly storyline, or so as not to offend the CCP, or to muzzle a, an NBA executive because he tweeted out something supportive of or to, or to fi fire in his freedom you know yeah yeah what what how was that decision made did you consider the negative impacts on your own brand did you consider the negative impacts um you know on american values maybe i'm over overstating that so mm -hmm. i don't I, i'm not i don't want to suggest they're going to come into some bomb throwing right uh committee spectacle i get that th this is very complicated uh, I, I want to engage them. And if they have a coherent counter argument, I'm more than happy to entertain it. But I, I think it's helpful for them to hear uh, from the representatives of the American people that that this this upsets a, a lot of people. There are serious concerns with the way these companies and industries have behaved. But once we get to the economics, so I'm I'm very worried that we're doing something very counterproductive here. Maybe mm -hmm. the, we've talked about the parallel before to uh, cutting off J Japanese oil supplies in the late 1930s. Uh, suppose we successfully disengage and reshore, cut China off from the rest of the world so it's on its own. Well, um, you know, then it has to develop its own industry and then it has much less to lose. Uh, isn't our goal, we are not yet fighting the war. I thought our long run goal was to engage China, to have it a fully engaged, properly behaving uh, part of the world economy. It's still very poor, still has a long way to go. Uh, I, it's much, if they see that they have nothing to lose economically by grabbing Taiwan, as opposed to uh, there's this wonderful piñata of stuff from engagement with the rest of the world. I think that, you know, there, there's a carrot as well as the stick. Hey, John, John we tried it, man. We gave huge carrots, man. And, Thank carrots. and, then, and you know, I, I think we and it so, worked. They sometimes didn't in life, Taiwan yet. Sometimes in life, you're disappointed, man. You know, I mean, we, we tried it. And and, and but it sometimes fails, what and, you're trying to do and, has the opposite effect of what you want. No, I, I'm talking off China about China right now may make them more likely to do things you don't want to do. Starting the war when you don't have to start it is John, always John, listen, man. I mean, okay, this goes back to Neil's question too. Like, why, why aren't more Americans? You know, uh, you know, we're accommodating to the party. Hey, the reason is Xi Jinping, man, and what he's doing. You know, I mean, how how about you know, how about extinguishing human freedom in this country? How about genocide? How about, you know, millions of people in concentration camps and, and rectification camps and re-education? How about extinguishing human freedom in Hong Kong? How about Jimmy Lai, you know, you know, sitting in a jail right now, along with lots of other political prisoners? Right. And then how about saying, hey, man, I own the ocean in the South China Sea, the area through which one third of the world's surface trade flows. How about the threats to Taiwan or Japan or South Korea, for that matter? Absolutely. How about bludgeoning Indian soldiers to death on the Himalayan frontier? How about a sustained campaign of additional espionage against us? <laughs> how about foisting COVID on the world and then adding insult to injury it's with foreign with, diplomacy? So I'm just saying that we, we keep blaming ourselves like we don't want to like, man, no, 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 we might, no. we might start a war with China by being, you know, comp competitive with them instead of rolling you over, absolutely. you know? They need to see the carrot of engagement with us so that we can talk about all these issues and make progress on these issues. Once it's a war, 
Once it's a shooting war, oh, they say, I mean, what the there, hell? We'll but there can be want. there can be sticks in terms of altering the behavior. Look what the party's doing now. They're saying, oh, we really will never crack down on the tech sector again. You know, we promise. I mean, they're desperate to track back in the investors. They scared away with their own action, with the crackdown on, on the tech sector. It's all it's all lies. It's all bullshit. You know? But, you know, U.S. investors, they're going to do what they always do. They'll send more money to China. You know, because because they were, they saw it, read it in the Wall Street Journal. You know that China's not going to crack down the tech sector anymore, and and that that capital, I believe, is going to get stranded. I mean, I really think we're into a, into a situation where, as Neil said from the beginning, Xi Jinping does not make decisions like we would. We have to stop mirror imaging him. He's driven by fear of losing control. He's driven by this aspiration in, in his mind and his warped view of history. You know, do you ever see Drunk History, the show of Drunk History? It's worth what? It's pretty humorous. You know, Xi Jinping, is, he's like, it's like a version of Drunk History where all the ills of, of the Chinese people were caused during the century of humiliation. Hey, man, the Chinese Communist Party, ask Frank Decoder, you know, caused the Ill, ills for them. So I, I think- well, We have our own that, Drunk History these days. <laughs> I think- I, I think that we can't we can't be self-referential here, you know, and we have to recognize that to be tough. Right. You know, it, you know, all we've had over the years is carrots and baby carrots. Right. We need to have some sticks, too. You know, if we want if we want China to conclude and we asked about the objective. Right. Mike, I think the objective is the Chinese Communist Party's leaders at some point, based on our return to competitive arenas, recognize, hey, I can have enough of my dream enough of, of national rejuvenation without pursuing it at everyone else's expense or at, at the freedom of, of, of their own people, you know? And, and so uh, maybe that'll happen at some point in the future, but certainly if we continue to just cooperation and accommodation, that's not going to happen. Cause we know, we know what that, what that, what that spurred, you know, it, it spurred the militarization of the South China sea. It spurred all the, all the economic aggression against us. Could I test a working hypothesis against this group? And I say this, I agree with what Neil said earlier about <clears throat> Xi Jinping looking at Taiwan as his legacy issue. Um, uh, I, but I wonder if, if, if one of the arguments I've heard from kind of the neo-engagement crowd is that this is just a Xi Jinping problem. That as soon as he goes away, you know, we can go back to the status quo ante. I don't know if that's like status quo ante Trump or where that begins. I, I don't I don't think that's true. I, I think this is more than just a, a Xi Jinping problem. And maybe there's a little bit of recency bias. I, I just read Alex Josky's I read it a while ago, reread Alex Josky's book about um, how the peaceful rise narrative, he sort of argues, was a deliberate espionage and covert action campaign to sort of convince a lot of our elites about the, the values. This is Spies and Lies. Great spies book. I yeah. saw your blurb on the cover, Mike. Excellent book. Yeah. Excellent book. So I, I don't know. I mean, am I wrong in thinking that this is uh, more than a Xi Jinping problem, that there's something embedded in the party's DNA such as it exists that leads it to a more confrontational approach. Um, okay, Neil and John, you go first, and then I have a story about this. You guys go well, first. I, I mean, I'm not going to pretend to be a, a China expert, but I try and talk to people who are. I think I think there's obviously more than one faction in the CCP. And although she's uh, entirely dominant now, as the Congress made clear, it's also true that those people who... Uh, favoured engagement and economic liberalisation, uh, they're still around and they're not happy. Uh, and the disgruntlement uh, at the high level, not, not just amongst students at Tsinghua, must have been a part of the reason for the abandonment of, of zero COVID. I don't think it's right to think of the CCP as just lots and lots and lots of little Xi Jinping's in a sort of enormous pyramid with him at the top. It's conceivable that a, a, a change of leadership down the line, which inevitably will come, would have some significant policy implications. Uh, I think there's also a generational point to be made here. Uh, my friend Li Daokui once said to me uh, when I was visiting at Tsinghua, everything in China is intelligible in terms of generations. And the generation that's now coming to power, this is shortly after Xi Jinping had ascended to the presidency, was entirely shaped by the Cultural Revolution. And, and that is their kind of point of reference. Their nightmare is a kind of uh, resurgence of, of Dong Ran, of chaos, but they also have this sense that the, there were 
aspects of Maoism that were admirable. The next generation will definitely not think that way. And so I, I don't think we should assume that, that China's completely set on a course. I also take myself back 10 years or thereabouts when I was making a television series about China, just as Xi Jinping was uh, emerging as the dominant player. And it was very striking to me then how big a change this likely represented. So I, I don't think we should assume that there is a kind of inevitable continuity and the next Chinese leaders will have similar goals, because I don't think that's borne out by the the, the long run of, of <coughs> Chinese history or the recent past. John? I would speculate um, that Taiwan is going to always be a problem because it, it, it just represents the alternative, is there for all to see. How can the CCP stay in power as, a, as an autocratic communist regime? And you have the evidence right there. Here's what could happen. Here are people who are Chinese, just like you, living free liberal de democracy, living much better. They're, you know, that uh, GDP is much better. They're much more productive. You could have this. Here is what you would look like if the nationalists had won the civil war. That has got to be just a perpetual thorn in the side of anything that's going to be a CCP until they give up and, and look more like Taiwan. So I, I don't see how they can avoid, like what they did with Hong Kong, uh, you know, let it sit for a while, but then gradually strangle. It has to be uh, their long run strategy, unless, you know, someday, uh, as soon as we we all like the Soviet Union, as soon as we all think it's inevitable and it'll last forever, boom! Uh, eventually, it has to go. But it just is is such a piece of evidence uh, against their fundamental value that I don't see how they can let it sit like this forever. Hey, John, let's hear the story. Hey, okay, all right, but you know, hey, first of all, I want to congratulate Mike too because I just think the title of the of the committee is right. You said the CCP. The CCP is does not mean the Chinese people. And to get the point that John made, hey, we don't want China to fail, right? We want the CCP to fail in its designs, which which are which they would carry out at, at our at our expense. I but asked I for that edit, uh, HR, uh, for that reason. Good for you, uh, and I think in the floor debate it allowed me because a lot of my Democratic I didn't mean to interrupt, but I think it's an interesting yeah. point. A lot of my Democratic colleagues are attacking the committee because it's going to fuel anti-Asian hate or whatever. I think that's the argument. Yeah. But making that constant distinction between the party and the people and Chinese Americans who are subject to coercion, absolutely. I think is a critical task. Sorry to jump in there. Yeah, it absolutely is a critical task, you know. And so, hey, this is the, our last day of a long day of meetings, you know, in in the uh, in the in the, in the great hall of the people with uh, President Trump, right? And you know, he he gets get, he got grouchy, man. But at the end of the day, he, he hated like long meetings like that anyway. So, but he's like, why are we doing this meeting? You know, and it was with Lee Keshong, the premier, who's who's the, he's the titular head of state, right? So this is theater to kind of go along with this idea that Lee Keshong, rather than Xi Jinping, it's anyway. So long, you know, long table. Both delegations on each side, and I, you know, I'll just tell you the Lee Keshong start with this long so soliloquy in which, you know, in which he uh, he basically said, "Hey, you know, we don't need you anymore, right? We we are in a, in a position of, of power relative to you now, and here's what the future looks like. The future looks like we lead in everything, in technology, in advanced manufacturing, and hey, if you're lucky, you can sell us agricultural products." Uh, and raw materials, maybe some oil, natural gas. How's that sound? You know, I mean, that was the thrust of it. So I think to your question of what's changed, part of what's changed is they believed that they were in a position of tremendous advantage over us, not only economically, but if you if you look at Chinese news every day, they're probably believing their own propaganda. Chinese news every day is how great the party is and what the party has done for you, how great Xi Jinping is and what Xi Jinping has done for you and how screwed up the free world is especially the United States, right? And and so when they looked at us, you know, from the outside, our democracy is messy, right? Look at all the, the traumas we've been through in recent years. They thought, hey, these guys are over. And if you want more evidence of it, just read the joint statement, you know, with Xi Jinping and Putin prior to the Olympics. They laid it out. The message is, hey, you're done. You're over. We're in charge now. Get used to it. And I think that's what's different. But the design was always in place. You know, we mentioned Joski's book. But hey, also Roche Doshi, uh, who's in the administration, wrote the yeah. book, The Long Game, which yeah. also uh, th that's the whole thesis of the book is, hey, this is always what they wanted to do. You know, and Frank Decoder's last volume of his four volume on the uh, four volume uh, study of the party is also great on this topic.
We have a few minutes left on the show. Congressman, before you leave, I'd like to get your thoughts on the uh, current Washington uh, scandal du jour, and that is the issue of classified documents. I trust nothing behind you as a classified document. I trust nothing behind HR as a classified document. But can you just give us your sense, Congressman, of what's going on here or what reforms you think need to be made? And HR, maybe you'd like to give us a story about how you dealt with classified documents when you were at the NSC. Well, if the, if the door of my basement is locked, does that turn it into a, a skiff, a sensitive compartment and information facility? Yeah. Listen, this is, uh, uh, I mean, it, it, I was a former counterintelligence officer. So the idea that these documents are being handled this recklessly is crazy to me. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's just different at the White House HR just because I don't know how it works with classified documents there. I mean, because presumably you can bring them into the president's office, but usually a classified document doesn't leave a skiff and then for for Biden to downplay it and say hey don't worry my corvette was locked in my garage you know i take this very seriously <laughs> it is laughable so we've requested a battle damage assessment effectively from the dni that hopefully we're going to get next week when we're back to understand what was in these documents you know could they have potentially endangered sources and methods i don't know but i i said on tv this morning um you know this should actually be a wake up call uh to congress um on a slightly related issue which is that we're a target for uh, so-called FIS, Foreign Intelligence and Security Services, uh, the CCP's uh, intelligence entities foremost among them. And we all get a clearance as soon as we're elected with no background investigation. Everybody, you know, George Santos included, gets a, tor- a, a top secret clearance. There's no, you know, coherent brief on here's what you need to do to make yourself a hard target. I mean, two-factor authentication, just the basic thing. So we all need to wake up to the fact that we're targets for foreign intelligence uh, collection. And, and we we just don't have that uh, culture on the Hill right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll tell you, when I was national security advisor, there was a process in place, right? And, and uh, and you know, the NSC staff, the professionals that are there know, know how to run that process. I mean, in connection with what documents the presidencies, you know, in, in particular, and everything that goes in is logged in and then it gets logged out. Anything the president touches is supposed to then be preserved for the, for the National Archives and eventually maybe a presidential library. I don't know what happened after I left in 2018. I just can't even imagine like how those documents got to more in the case of President Trump or, or how these documents get to the to the vice president's garage. I mean, how does that happen? I'm not sure how that happens. So I think the investigation will, will show some of these vulnerabilities. But I'll tell you, Congressman Gallagher, you're so right about the, you know, the, the lack of training you know, for people who come in uh, and get a clearance for, for, for the first time and inadequate procedures. You know, I, I think the other the other thing is this is something maybe you could work on is a revision of the Presidential Records Act that allows you to, to use encryption apps. So all my phone calls right, I had to do just in the in the clear. I could never use Signal, could never use WhatsApp. Now, some people probably did in violation, but I didn't do that. I went to a classified line if it was classified, never, never spoke about anything classified on the unclass line. But on some things that are just mildly sensitive, I mean, it, it might be good to be able to, you know, come up with a way to use encryption, uh, wow. but then, but then also preserve it, you know. For and and I don't know if there's an app that, you know, that that uh, you know that Signal or something could create that would allow us to do that. But but that's something maybe to work on. Hey, talk about a niche issue that no one else is running with. We can own that one on the select. Remember, <laughs> this brings, us, this brings <laughs> us back to Cold War too, because right. I think what people don't fully grasp and it needs to be said again and again, is that this is a tougher Cold War than Cold War I. Not only is the Chinese economy much, much bigger than the Soviet economy ever was, but the level of penetration of our institutions is far higher. The number of Soviet spies was always finite, and we kind of knew who they were. We have only just begun to to understand the scale of the penetration by the Chinese uh, in, intelligence agencies, and when we when we when we take when we fully take account of that, we're going to realize how much harder this Cold War is going to be to win. I really want us to emphasize that because it sounds niche to talk about how do we have encrypted calls in government or how do we get people in Congress to use two-factor authentication. It is a massive, massive issue. You know, most people remember the Cold War these days, the first Cold War in terms of James Bond, right? It's about a, a fairly glamorous world of espionage. But when you look back on that, you almost feel nostalgia because the KGB was such a, a definable target. 
I just don't know the scale of the problem we confront now. And oh. TikTok, which we barely touched on, but I know it's a big issue for you, Congressman, is is part of the story because they're they're able to mm. gain intelligence in entirely novel ways just by getting the data of American teenagers in a vast, vast quantity. So I I can't emphasize enough. Cold War II is going to be harder to win than Cold War I. Indeed, we could lose it. And we got to, got to, got to focus on that scenario. But, but I, I think we're missing the, the point here. Uh, so there's, there's two points here. One is um, how much actual espionage are China and Russia getting out of the folders stuck in boxes next to Joe Biden's Corvette? Not much. Uh, this is not uh, what the story tells us. What it tells the average American like me is that every White House is completely chaotic and fairly incompetent. And that includes Hillary Clinton's laptop. That <laughs> includes Trump's Mar-a-Lago stuff. And now Joe Biden's uh, Joe Biden's Corvette. Second, but what it tells us, uh, what is this doing with special prosecutor investigations? Uh, this stuff is all uh, this is all my this is pull you over because you have a light out kind of stuff uh, it, it judicially. This is part of our going after partisan politics through the judicial system, which needs to stop. And I, I'm kind of grateful to Joe Biden. Uh, Trump now gets a get a get out of jail free card. And there's no way they can prosecute him legally for his stuff when Joe Biden. Yeah, they're going to go, oh, Biden's wasn't as bad and so forth. But we really need to get out of partisan politics through special prosecutors, impeachments, uh, and over, come on, really relatively minor stuff in the big issue. Now, that issue, I think, is, is really the where, where the Joe Biden thing goes. Let's turn it back to the, the other issue, the real issue that Neil met, which is not about presidential paper documents in the wrong place, but about the espionage. And we started with TikTok. Maybe we can end with TikTok. Yes. I don't understand what is, maybe you can make this precise for us. Where is the great threat to national security if a media company takes, you know, what 12-year-olds watching videos on TikTok and knows where they are and what they want to buy? What is exactly the danger that comes out of this? And if I could add to that, Congressman, you've called TikTok digital fentanyl. Is it really analogous to a lethal drug? Uh, well, I saw that analogy from FCC Commissioner Brennan Carr, and I think okay. it's apposite in the sense that it's highly addictive, if not deadly, if you factor mm -hmm. in anxiety, depression, and suicide. And ultimately can be traced back to China. Obviously, the precursors of fentanyl are traced back to China and TikTok is owned by ByteDance. ByteDance is a Chinese company that's effectively controlled by the CCP. So for that, I think it's a it's a useful. But wait, can, uh, can we stop on that one? Yeah. So I'm old enough to remember comic books are terrible. They're rotting the minds of American children. We need to get them off of comic books. Uh, it's not obvious that playing with this is a separate issue. Where they're playing with social with with people uh, don't people don't get the news from comic books uh, and okay, young Americans no. increasingly get the news from uh, TikTok. Uh, let's keep comic, it comic books could not track your location. Okay, TikTok let's can it. track your location. They lied about it, and now they're uh, there's a report from Forbes uh, last week that su uh, uh, suggested they were tracking the location of journalists because journalists were writing negative stories about TikTok. It's as if in '58 we let. Pravda and the KGB by the Chicago Tribune, the Washington Post, the New York Times. And that probably understates the threat posed by allowing TikTok to become the most dominant media company in America. It creates a massive platform for CCP well, come, propaganda. Come, come in we're, we're America. We're competition. There's multiple sources. Then they can sell it to an American company. The concept of a private company it does not exist in China in the same way it exists in America. And that basic ownership structure makes it problematic. They must act by law as an arm of the government. So and now I think if you place it in context, you know, look at the bro other broad range of United Front Work Department work that goes on, including now, as we know, opening clandestine police stations in the United States to police the Chinese to the diaspora. Let's you know, so they're going to TikTok. track their locations through TikTok. You know, and they're, they're going to, you well, know, they're, they're going to, I mean, TikTok. If, I'm, if I'm a journalist and I don't want to be tracked, I turn off TikTok. That's not hard. TikTok, 99% of the users of TikTok are teenagers who are watching videos of dogs. It's, it's, no, I, I, me I, how that is a national security risk. If, if the CCP knows that a teenager went down to Burger King to watch a video of dogs on it. Well, I wrote a column on this uh, quite a while ago now, uh, which agrees with uh, Congressman Gallagher. Uh, and I started out, uh, John, thinking uh, just the way you you think, and then I started to do my homework. And the first thing I did was to uh, ask my uh, my son, who's now eleven, to uh, to talk to me about TikTok and show me how it worked. And uh, once you start seeing the world from 
that vantage point from the vantage point of an American kid, you realize that it's very insidious. I have a confession to make my part in America's downfall. The CEO of TikTok, uh, Shuzi Chu, uh, was in my class at Harvard Business School. Uh, uh, he came uh, fourth in the section, extraordinarily talented student. And uh, uh, you have to hand it to them. They, they, they ate Facebook's lunch. They ate, basically ate American social media companies lunch. But you're right, Congressman, it is a deeply dangerous thing that all that data uh, is being uh, made available. It certainly is available to the CCP. And we can't be complacent about it. And the analogy with fentanyl is not, I think, overdone. You know, we aren't really, and this is a subject for another show one day, we aren't really taking seriously enough the mental health epidemic amongst young Americans. 25% of girls aged between 11 and 17 suffer from serious depression. 25%. Jonathan Haidt told me that just the other day. Um, we're kind of old, uh, unlike Congressman Gallagher. The good fellas are not, you know, spring chickens. Well, okay, uh, age two is catching up with you, but you're still fresh faced by comparison with grizzled old me. Um, it's very hard for us to fully understand, John, what it's like to be an American teenager online all the time with these extraordinarily addictive apps. And the fact that the most successful one is essentially Chinese controlled, that should scare us more, more than it's scaring you. And hey, will you say, Neil and, and Mike, just also to get to John's question, like, why should we worry about it? Can you talk a little more about algorithmic bias and what the concern is there? Well, one of the things that I, I think it was Forbes again revealed recently is that TikTok was sort of deprioritizing via algorithmic bias or algorithmic interference uh, certain videos related to voting around the election. So we talk about all the concern with Russian meddling in our election in 2016. The app provides a platform for the CCP to meddle in our own election simply by manipulating uh, the algorithm. There was another report that Brennan Carr highlighted uh, where, and I'm, correct me if I, I mangled this, but basically they intensified certain videos or promoted certain videos uh, relate, like if, if, a, if uh, for young women that had, uh, you know, interest in eating disorders or, or things like that, and in some ways intensified the anxiety that Neil uh, is citing there. So, and I think it's all bound up in the lack of transparency around the algorithm itself. Uh, algorithmic opacity is one of the concerns uh, with TikTok. So um, completely endorse everything Neil said about uh, the good work that Jonathan Haidt has done. I think Coddling in the American Mind is a is an, a, really one of the best books of the last decade. You guys are on, on the larger issue of this yes. tech and what, what it has done to mental health of kids, which I entirely agree with. But remember, that was Facebook, then it was Snapchat, then it was WhatsApp, then it was YouTube videos, then it was TikTok. I'll bet you guys a, a nice beer or a whiskey in, uh, in uh, Neil's case that three years from now, the teenagers will be onto something else and and yeah. uh, and TikTok will be in the Facebook's position of saying, oh my gosh, only people over 30 currently use me on, on my user's way on the way down uh no tech platform lasts that long uh you know even even twitter's on its on its way out already so i your competition will work so congressman gallagher we had a rather spirited conversation here on goodfellows last month about the merits of soccer v football or football versus football uh if you will neil ferguson defending the world cup uh, hr mcmaster kind of <laughs> and a little disdain over what soccer is all about. We Americans have a hard time getting excited about zero, zero shootouts, if you will. But I thought maybe this is a chance for you as a resident of Wisconsin and cheesehead to explain the Neo, the virtues, the wonders of being able to watch playoff football here in America for the next month. Well, it loses some of its beauty when the green and gold aren't playing. Okay, <laughs> so I'm currently down on football, but soccer, I don't even recognize as a sport. In fact, I think we hosted a like Munich versus <laughs> some other team at Lambo this year. I didn't go. I was offended that those cleats were allowed <laughs> to touch the hallowed ground of Lambo field. Well, those of us who watched the world cup, uh, were privileged to see one of the greatest sporting ev events of all time, the world cup final, uh, between Argentina and France. So I kind of rest my case. I don't even need to, I don't need to have this argument. I think Lionel Messi won it for me. That's it for this episode of Goodfellows. On behalf of my colleagues, Neil Ferguson, John Cochran, H.R. McMaster, our very special guest today, Congressman Mike Gallagher, we'd like to thank you for joining us. We'll be back again in about two weeks or so. It'll be our 100th episode of Goodfellows, so you don't want to miss that. So again, thanks for watching today, and we will see you very soon. Take care.
If you enjoyed this show and are interested in watching more content featuring H.R. McMaster, watch Battlegrounds, also available at hoover.org.